Have you ever wondered how plugging in your charger on the wall socket charges the battery of your mobile phone? It is actually an interesting process where the 220 volts on the wall socket undergoes different stages to reach the 5 volts needed by our gadget. And in connection to our course, these stages utilize various electronic devices as shown in the diagrams above. Good day, Nixers, and welcome to this session on the practical application of electronics, a direct current power supply where the output voltage can be changed or varied. The intended learning outcome for this session are as follows. At the end of this lesson, the learner shall be able to differentiate the construction and principle of operation for various semiconductors used in power electronics. Before we proceed, the lesson today is for educational purposes only and will involve a discussion on how to connect electronic components. It involves alternating and direct currents. As such, never take an electric shock on purpose. Working with electricity can be fatal and a current of less than 1 ampere can cause death. Should you decide to make this as a project, use personal protective equipment while working and do so with the guidance and supervision of a trained and qualified person. The creator of this video will not be liable for any untoward incidents arising because of this video. That being said, let's start. To start our discussion, let us start with the wiring diagram. So for this diagram, Davao Light, Meralco, or any other electric power distribution companies deliver electricity in our respective homes, enabling these wall sockets to have 220 volts RMS, electrical power supply. RMS here stands for root mean square, and it is the voltage which can be measured using our multimeters or multi-testers. Take note of this test instrument as we will introduce another test instrument later. This 220 volts RMS is represented by this symbol in the schematic diagram as shown here and is equivalent to the plug which connects our circuit later to an alternating current source or AC source. Now, as we can observe in the schematic diagram, from the AC power supply, it branched out into two separate directions in a similar way that our AC plug has two wires inside indicated by these red dots over here. This means that one of these wires will be connected to the ground while the other shall be connected to the rest of the circuit. If we take an oscilloscope and its accompanying probes and connect them as shown, we will be able to see this output waveform from the wires of the plug connected to the wall socket. Now before we explain how to read the values measured in an oscilloscope, let us first explain why we are using the oscilloscope as an instrument in our analysis here. Why not use a multi-tester, which we are already familiar with? Well, an instrument has its specific purpose. For the oscilloscope, it will show us the instantaneous waveform, meaning it can give us the instantaneous voltage value at a given moment of time in our analysis. We will be able to observe this later. Now, a few things to observe. Number one, the cyan-colored vertical line measures the voltage when the time equals zero which is equal to 0 volt. The yellow colored vertical line measures the voltage at time equals 3.979 milliseconds, which is equal to 308.97 volts. It says here that scale equals 10 milliseconds per division. This means horizontally, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4, each of these have a 10 millisecond interval. So 10, 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, okay? As you can observe, if this is 10, then this part over here where the yellow vertical readout is located is approximately 4 milliseconds or 3.979 milliseconds to be exact. Next, number four. Remember, we connect the oscilloscope probe to channel A. Here, the rotary switch is pointing to A, this line here. It says also that the scale is 200 volts per division. This means vertically from here, 1, 2, 3, and 4, each of this interval 
is 200 volts. Since the peak or maximum value of the waveform is between 1 and 2, we can approximate this to 300 volts or 308 volts to be exact as indicated in the T2 readout. Again, horizontal is for time interval. Vertical is for voltage interval. As such, an oscilloscope is an electrical instrument which graphically display the changing signal voltages in relation to time. One thing that might strike us here is, why is it that on the oscilloscope, the maximum voltage measured is approximately 308 volts? Well, if we use a multi-tester, the maximum voltage that can be measured is 220 volts. The answer to this question lies on what the electronic instrument is measuring. For testers, as discussed a while ago, it is the root mean square voltage, the RMS voltage. Well, for oscilloscope, 308 volts is the peak voltage or V-peak. In some other references, it's Vm, Vmax. V-peak and VRMS have a relationship, meaning we can solve one when the other is given. Example, in this case, VRMS is given as 220 volts. Now, square root of 2 times the voltage in RMS is equal to V-peak. As such, when we multiply 220 volts with square root of 2, which is equivalent to 1.414, we get 311.13 volts, which is close to the measured value of 308.97 here. Now that we have an idea of how an oscilloscope works and what the voltage waveform of the 220 VRMS looks like, let us now explore what will happen when we connect this supply to a transformer. Now, before we discuss how we will interconnect the AC source to the transformer, let us first watch this video to be acquainted on how a transformer works. Transformers are composed of an iron core ring wrapped in coils. One coil is connected to an AC input voltage and is called the primary coil. The other coil is connected to an output circuit with a load resistance and is called the secondary coil. The two coils are well insulated from each other and do not form a physical electrical connection. This gives a transformer its unique electricity altering properties. Transformers can either step up or step down a voltage. In a step-down transformer, the number of turns in the primary coil is greater than the number of turns in the secondary coil. In a step-up transformer, the number of turns in the secondary coil is greater than the number of turns in the primary coil. The constantly changing current driven by an alternating voltage source induces a changing magnetic field in the core of the transformer. The magnetic field created by the alternating current in the primary coil generates the flux in the transformer core. The secondary coil converts the flux back into current flow and produces a voltage at the load or resistance in the secondary circuit. If there are fewer coil turns on the secondary than on the primary, this is called a step-down transformer. The resulting voltage in the secondary circuit will be less than the primary. In this example, we have 20 turns on the primary coil and 10 turns on the secondary coil. To determine the decrease in voltage occurring in this step-down transformer, we can use a simple ratio formula. This formula simply states that the secondary voltage to primary voltage ratio is the same as the secondary coil to primary coil turn ratio. Rearranging the formula and then dividing 10 turns by 20 turns, we get 0.5 multiplied by 120 V. This results in a calculated step-down voltage of 60 volts. As discussed in the video, a transformer has a primary and a secondary windings inside. The primary shall be connected to the AC supply or the plug as what we do here in the schematic diagram and wiring diagram. Notice how the interconnections on the schematic diagram are similar to the interconnections on the wiring diagram. Now this transformer is a step-down transformer. 
from large input voltage to lower secondary voltage. Its secondary windings are labeled 12, 0, 12. If we use either one of these blue wires labeled as 12 and one black wire labeled as 0 volt, the output voltage on the spare of secondary windings of the transformer will be 12 volts VRMS. On the schematic diagram, only two wires of the secondary winding is utilized as indicated by the red dots over here. As such, we will not use the middle black wire so that we will have an output voltage from the two blue wires of 12 plus 12 or 24 volts RMS. Now, connecting these two wires to the oscilloscope as shown here to view the output waveform on the secondary windings, the voltage waveform will look like this. Take note that the voltage output changed. From 310 volts peak on the primary, it became 33.866 volts peak on the secondary. As such, after passing through the transformer, the output waveform is still alternating current or AC in its waveform, although this time it is already smaller than the supply voltage, which is an evidence of stepping down. To make this waveform have a semblance of direct current, we now connect it to diodes or rectifiers. This diode is already a compact form of a full wave bridge rectifier diode with four terminals. This is the same with soldering four diodes as shown here. We can also observe markings on the diode. An AC waveform symbol, a plus and a minus sign. The AC waveform symbol shall be connected to the two secondary wires of the transformer which, as we have discussed a while ago, has a step-down AC waveform. These two terminals is the same with these yellow terminals. The plus sign here is equivalent to the anode connection on the full wave rectifier, while the minus sign is equivalent to the cathode connection on the full wave rectifier. Remember, the thin gray line is the cathode for a diode. The thick black part is the anode. For the connections, secondary windings goes to AC connections on the full wave rectifier as shown here. We will have a resistor in series with an LED or a light emitting diode which will be connected into the anode and cathode of the full wave rectifier as shown here. This load is needed to observe the output voltage waveform of the full wave rectifier using our oscilloscope. As we can observe, from 33.866 volts, it became 31.720 volts after passing through the full wave bridge rectifier. There is decrease in voltage to account the voltage drop on the two diodes of the full wave rectifier. Also, notice that all voltages are above the white line, meaning the waveform does not involve negative values. It is similar to a beating heart, a pulse. That is why this waveform is called pulsating direct current or pulsating DC. Notice also that the frequency doubled. From 60 Hz, it became 120 Hz. These are the things that happened when the signal or the voltage passes through the diodes, specifically a full wave bridge rectifier. Now, since what we have is still pulsating DC, we now pass this waveform to a filter, which is basically a capacitor. Here we see an electrolytic capacitor, a type of capacitor which is polarized, and with polarized meaning it has a negative and a positive terminal. On an actual electrolytic capacitor, we can easily distinguish the negative terminal as the gray part labeled with a minus sign. Now, for the connections, the cathode of the rectifier shall be connected to the positive terminal of the capacitor, while the anode of the rectifier shall be connected to the negative terminal of the capacitor. Another way of saying this is we connect the capacitor parallel to the load that we have interconnected a while ago. If we use our oscilloscope to display the output waveform, the result will be like this. The capacitor charges and discharges as indicated by 31.788 volts and 30.681 volts in this graph. It can be observed that it no longer goes below the minimum value, but only rises and falls, charges and discharges 
between these two values. This fluctuation in voltage is called ripple. Since the output voltage waveform of the capacitor has ripples, it is not yet pure direct current. It needs to pass through the last stage known as the regulator stage. And this stage involves the use of voltage regulators. For example, Zener diode, or in this particular circuit, an integrated circuit voltage regulator called LM317. As we can see, the LM317 IC or integrated circuit has three terminals, namely the V-in terminal or input voltage terminal, the V-out terminal or the output voltage terminal, and the adjust terminal, which as its name suggests, this is where we will connect the adjustable electronic component, the potentiometer or variable resistor. We can adjust the voltage by turning this knob over here. Same with when you increase and decrease the volume of your radio up and down by rotating a knob clockwise and counterclockwise. That is actually a personal encounter with a potentiometer. For the LM317IC to work properly, we need an additional resistor. This set up the combination of LM317IC, a potentiometer, and a resistor is the regulator of our power supply. It ensures that with each turn of our potentiometer, a fixed voltage output is produced. This fixed voltage output is now in pure direct current form or regulated direct current. Now for the connections, shown here is the LM317 pinout. Pin out or the designation of the terminals for V in, V out, and adjust. We also see the circuit inside the LM317, composed of different electronic components. We have a Zener diode, a Darlington resistor, an operational amplifier, and protection circuits. It is for this reason that the LM317 is called an integrated circuit. Pinagsama samang electronic components sa iisang chip. Now, let us rotate the LM317 counterclockwise to better understand the connection. Meaning, this is the adjust terminal, the output terminal, and the input terminal. As such, the connection will be as shown. Adding a load resistor, the circuit will be as shown. The output voltage waveform when the oscilloscope is connected to the load resistor will be a varying DC voltage between 1.75 to 14.3 volts. The problem with this power supply is we can control its output DC voltage between 1.75 volts to 14.3 volts, but we can't see the value without using a test instrument, in this case an oscilloscope or a multi-tester. As such, we connect a voltmeter in parallel with the load resistor, as shown here. Now, we can turn the potentiometer, look at the voltmeter for the DC voltage equivalent to the battery voltage of our cell phone, get our mobile phone, and the cord. Cut the cord open and connect or solder the red and black wires to the output of our power supply. We now got ourselves a charger, or a DC power supply. When done charging, we can connect other direct current loads, just like a 12-volt DC LED light bulb. Just make sure to turn the potentiometer and increase the voltage output. And watch the voltmeter for the appropriate output voltage fit for the load. As a summary, shown is the different stages. The AC voltage passed through, starting from the bottom to the top. The input to the primary winding of the transformer is 220 volts RMS. The secondary winding output voltage of the transformer, which will serve as input to the full wave bridge rectifier, is now a step down, 24 volts RMS. The output of the rectifier, which will serve as input to the capacitor filter, is a pulsating DC voltage equivalent to 22.48 volts RMS, which decreased due to the voltage drop across the full wave rectifier. The output of the filter, which will serve as input to the regulator, 
has a ripple with the maximum and minimum values of 21.69 volts to 22.48 volts respectively. Lastly, the output of the regulator is a variable or can be changed DC voltage between the values of 1.75 to 14.3 volts direct current where we can now connect our direct current loads such as rechargeable batteries. That would be all for this lesson. If you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel if you are not yet subscribed, and ring the notification bell so that you will be updated in our latest uploads. Give feedback in the comment section below. And as always, I'll see you on the next one.